Well, welcome, Samia, to the Flower Podcast. Thank you, Scott. I'm so happy to be a part of this. Finally, after how many months? I know. Well, I mean, we had a few things going on there for a while. So um, things happen when they're supposed to. That's why I believe most of the time. So um, it's all good. Well, I, I will say this, that I have been a follower and a fan of you on Instagram for quite some time. And um, I am, and it, I feel like in a way, I'm going to go out there and say this. I feel in a way we're kindred spirits because I feel like we have almost the exact same taste in flowers. Every time I see you do <laughs> something, I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, this is so incredible. Um, and I just, I, I don't know. I just, I, I love everything you, you do. So, well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And so, um, I want, there's so many things to talk about today. I, mm -hmm. get, we have to start at the beginning as always. Yep. And yep. how did you get, how did your journey into flowers begin? Right. So my journey into flowers really began with the way in which I grew up. Uh, my parents had 20 acres and we used to farm a lot of it for ourselves, right? From fruits and vegetables to flowers, to berries, everything. And we just, it wasn't our source of income or anything like that, but it was something that we did as a family. And ever since I was young, my mother and I had flower gardens. We had perennial gardens. And then later in my childhood, we started to dabble with cut flowers. And it was just something that we did together. Just, you know, let's trial this, let's do this this summer. And I'll never forget the summer before I went off to college was the year that we really put some effort into it. And although it was a really small patch of earth, really, really small patch, and it was a myriad of all different things, things that probably don't even make sense together, um, everything grew incredibly. I mean, Bells of Ireland up to my waist, dahlias the size of, you know, plates, everything. Just everything was beautiful and inspiring. And it was something that gave me a lot of joy that summer before we left for college. And I can remember whenever my mom would come up in the fall or I'd come back and visit, she would have flowers from the garden ready for me. She'd bring up stems to my dorm room or, you know, if I came back for the weekend, I'd find myself out there in the early fall. And it was like one of those things that that's where you got bit, right? That, that was that <laughs> moment where you just say, I'm different because of this. Uh, this makes me feel something. This makes yes. me feel amazing. And it wasn't like I hadn't loved flowers before that. Okay. But there was something about that summer and not only did it did we grow everything and it was so beautiful and that connection between the two of us and the earth, but I started to design. My mom had beautiful antique pottery. So then I would start to experiment with, oh, well, what would this be like in here and that and that? And you know, I just spent the whole summer designing. And it was one of those things that you realize, okay, I love this. I love the way this makes me feel, but you never think it's going to be a career, right? It's not a career choice. It's just something you like to do because God forbid you do something that you love for your career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> so it took me a few years to figure out that flowers kept calling, kept calling, kept calling. And I went to school for something totally different. And um, I went to college at Holy Cross. I was pre-med for half of it. Then I got really, really excited by biological psychology. So I majored in that. And after college, I started to work in an outpatient psychiatric practice. And I was on my way to getting a neuroscience PhD and just all kinds of like, oh my gosh. not flowers. Yeah, not flowers. <laughs> but it kept drawing me back. And I was pursuing a second degree. And I said to myself at the time, I was real young, and I'm like, I would love to just get a job, a part-time job in a flower shop while I'm going to school. This would just be something very fun for me. And lo and behold, every day I would show up for work. I was trying to pick up more shifts. I was trying to get more involved. I could feel this pull of like, I'm not sure this second degree is, I don't know, this is what my life is supposed to be, right? So long story short, 
I had to I had to figure it out. So I worked at this flower shop for a couple of years, immersed myself in it, loved every single bit of it. And an opportunity came to be where this little tiny shop was for sale in my state. <clears throat> and I bought it. Uh, I was all of what, 22 and I had no experience whatsoever, zero with business, with, you know, really running a flower shop. Uh, obviously I knew how to design or I thought I did. Right. But the only experience I had was, was with working with that other um, store and they were an everyday store. They did very few special events. They did do some, but the culture was something that I fell in love with. It didn't matter what we were doing. I loved being around flowers and I loved the transactions with people, the interaction, the whole thing. So I was bit, that's how it happened. You know, that's 22 years ago. Um, but early on in my career, in the process of it, I started to realize that I liked the special event work. That was really where I felt challenged and really excited. And long, long story short, I started to really focus on weddings. Um, and that's kind of where the brand started to take flight, I would say. Amazing. So... <clears throat> Was this all where you in the same area you are now, or because you're in mm -hmm. you're in Rhode Island, correct? Yeah, I'm and in Rhode I, Island, and this was all in Rhode Island as well. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. so you haven't like tried, you haven't drifted across the country or something like that to get um, to this spot. No, no, I everything we I'm I'm in my third studio. We've moved around, but only because we needed to get bigger and have more room, but. Rhode Island is very small and we've, even though I've been in three different towns in the 22 years, they're all very close to each other. So moving isn't that big of a deal in Rhode Island because sure. it's pretty small. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So flowers by Samia then was mm -hmm. born in roughly 22 years ago. Did yeah. you, did you, I know you said that you primarily wanted to do weddings and events did you start off mm -hmm. that way like right out of the gate or did mm -hmm. you kind of have to mm -hmm. define yourself a little bit yeah i had to find myself i only knew the everyday kind of floristry right. um which i still find it's very fulfilling and you know a lot of customer interaction all that but that's all i really knew working at that other uh shop but i was two or three years in and i was i knew something else had to happen had to find our niche per se and someone encouraged me at the time to do a wedding show. So oh. back in the day when those wedding shows were a big deal, every bride would come out and there would be, you know, you know, every vendor under the sun. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, it was a major investment for me at the time. I can remember being like, well, it's either this is it, this is it. It's going to make us or break us. But um, we went all out and it was a hit. And I don't know, it, literally, that's how I started doing that wedding show. And from that point on, I realized this is super creative. These relationships we're building with people are really quite um, exciting for me. Uh, I was starting to get more and more into growing our own product ourselves. So it was all a perfect storm. It all worked out. It just felt right, that niche of weddings. Now, I, I want to say... Like before I even started this podcast, I believe I heard you on another podcast and I don't know which one it was, mm -hmm. but I remember at the time and correct me if I'm wrong, but like where you're at is like one of the biggest destinations for weddings. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Okay. Is that still true? I, did yeah. I hear that right? It is true. It is true. It's really crazy. So I think you heard me on Botanical Brouhaha. Most okay. Likely. Um, and I may have, I think I was sharing with Amy that believe it or not, Newport, Rhode Island, which is a coastal town in Rhode Island. If it's not the number one wedding destination spot in the country, it's either number one or number two. It really never wavers between those two. So when you think about it, we've got this little tiny state that's more popular for weddings than Hawaii. I mean, that's how you have to think about it. Oh, wow. I hadn't right? thought of that, but yeah. Yeah. So Newport beats out most places in the United States as the number one wedding destination. 
So there's a lot of weddings that are happening here. There's a lot of talent in our state and our neighboring states for the wedding industry. There's sure. also a lot of people coming in, right? From all, all kinds of designers from all over the country. So it's, it, you, you, you can find enough work here is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's amazing. So how many weddings a year, roughly? I know, well, mm -hmm. we're going to just ignore COVID, but we're saying, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. usually, how many do you do a year? Yeah. Any idea? We Well, in the beginning stages, I think I, volume was important to me. I wanted to do everything. I wanted to take everything. I wanted the most experience possible. And, you know, of course, you're like 20-something, and you have all this energy, and you right. don't need to sleep, and you don't have a lot of different responsibilities. So um, I can remember years we would, we would do 75 to 100 weddings. But now it's a lot different. I don't go for number. I don't go for number at all. I go for quality or what speaks to me or the connections I make with people. So we could have a year where we're doing 30. We could do 50. I, I mean, I really tell you every single year is different. It depends on what uh, events are coming our way and what we're taking, what we decide to take. Sure. Well, that's a great place to be in. How was that transition? Yeah. I'm curious. You know, a lot of times people are afraid to say no and they mm -hmm. realize, you know, that that's kind of, you know, like you said, they're young or are they're just starting out mm -hmm. and they, they feel like they can't turn anything away because, you know, mm -hmm. number one, cash flow, number two, just getting your name out there. Um, yeah. How was that transition for you? Yeah. Well, it took me a really long time to get there. I'm still not great at saying no. I'm really not. But I guess the only thing that pushes you to get to that point is when you say to yourself, I think I might be a better artist or I might be a better business person and I might, I might be a better human making sure that I actually tailor this in a comfortable way where my work is just so it's so rewarding for our customers. Okay. We don't want burnout. We don't want, it doesn't need to be about numbers and, and about getting every single wedding. It really doesn't. It needs to be about pride, what you're proud of putting out there. And I think that once you realize that being proud and not worrying about numbers, the rest is, it is very easy and, and um, the decisions get made for you. So I'm assuming you have a, a minimum as far as in doing weddings. That's one of those things that mm -hmm. helps filter out a lot too. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to say that because I'll be honest, up until this year, uh -huh. I never, ever put out a figure because my theory was always, okay, yes, bigger events, large scale things. That's really where I'm at, where I love to be however i love design and it and sometimes you know what that means that means that a small wedding with 25 people at one long table is just as fabulously creative and beautiful as that 250 person wedding you know at the newport mansion to me it's always been about what speaks to me what is what is creatively you know, enticing me. So I don't ever, I never wanted to put a number on, okay, well, our minimum, I'll just throw a number out. You know, if our minimum is 20,000, I'm going to miss that Thursday night wedding for 25 people, or even a Friday night wedding for 25 people where the table is just so out of control. It's just so gorgeous. And some of the elements around it, yeah, we might not be getting to 25, but my heart is full, you know, it's beautiful. Sure. And I feel connected to mm. the people and the flowers. So I use the word minimum kind of loosely, except for the fact that this year, I kind of really did say to not only our team, but clients that we're, we're talking with that if we're going to have these design conversations for say like Saturdays in the summer, we need to start at this number and that feels good too. You know, that feels good too, but I leave room for things that might not make that minimum. You never know. Right. You just never know. So. Well, that's, I was not expecting that answer, but um, I love that answer because uh, mm -hmm. it, I think when you have so much, going on in an area like you're at um it's okay to leave that room and it's a room to you know work um yeah. 
and I and probably I hate to say this, prob well I don't really I probably think that on that twenty five person fabulous table you probably make almost as much money sometimes as some of the bigger weddings with all the expenses and overhead. Um, right, and I you mean, know that's true. You can it, bigger doesn't mean making more money. Right, it often doesn't. Too many yeah. variables. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, I love that. I really do love that. Thank you. Um, absolutely. And so now, okay. So this love of gardening that sort of started all of this or the, the love mm -hmm. of growing those flowers, um, mm -hmm. do you still grow flowers? Yeah, I do. I still grow and I grow for our studio. I don't count on it the way I used to. I used to grow a lot and my family was really, really involved in it too. Um, whole gardens dedicated to floral and it was one of my favorite things about our business at that time there was to me and there's this is still the way I feel there is nothing better than getting up in the morning going out to the garden going out picking buckets and buckets of flowers and taking those right from the garden and going right to work with them okay and just there's nothing like it at the same token, there's absolutely nothing like coming home after a really long day and, you know, you've got like an hour left of sunshine and spending the end of that day in that garden picking blooms when you've been with them all day long because, you know, you just can't get enough. <laughs> you've been with them all day long, but there's something about that connection and being outside the earth, the flowers, just the whole feeling. I can't give that up. Even if it's two rows. I swear to you, if it's two rows of zinnias, I don't care what it is. If I can go outside at some point in, in my home life and walk those paths and bring those flowers into work, that's all I really need. Last year, we were crazy. I hardly grew a thing. This year, one of my goals for myself is for my own mental health, just to grow more, just, just for me to take those walks in the morning and, and, and do what I can bringing stuff in. But we're very fortunate that we have so many amazing local flower farmers in our area that they do all the hard work for me now, but um, I will never not grow something. I will yeah. never not grow flowers yeah. for myself or the reserve. I mean, it's the same, the same token. You know how it is. Something in my yard will be flushing. Absolutely perfect, beautiful. And of course I can't use the palette that week, right? <laughs> right. But it, it's so... I have no problem. I'll cut it and I'll be like, I'll bring it to the reserve and say, you know, there's going to be somebody, this is going to make some florist dream come true this week. You know what I mean? And I love that. I love watching that and watching those florists come in and be like, holy moly, like, where did this come from? So if it's not going to me, it's going to somebody and it all feels the same. It all feels great. Yeah, no, that is a great feeling. I, I've, I've experienced that a few times. Okay, so you, you just, we're gonna just take advantage of your name dropping and go right into the Floral Reserve. So <laughs> okay. it's, it's like you weren't busy enough already. You decided nope. you wanted to start this new project. So I'm sure a lot of people who listen to the Flower Podcast follow that, follow the, uh, excuse me, follow the reserve, but mm -hmm. I, and they probably know what it is, but they may or may not know how it began. So I'm curious. Okay. I'd love to hear that, that story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, when I was in the height of my studio career, which it's not like it's slowed down, but let's just say what I was doing, lots and lots of weddings. And I was traveling to the Boston flower market every week. Uh, that was our that, I'm in Rhode Island and the Boston market is about 45, 50 minutes away. And it's uh, more of a collective where there's a bunch of different wholesalers and one big building. And that was really the place to go if you needed something different, if you needed something exotic, if you needed, uh, you wanted to check out some local product. It was really, we didn't have so many of those resources here in Rhode Island. So I would find myself going to Boston a couple of times a week. Um, it's not an easy trip. It, you have to leave, you know, super early in the morning uh, to the traffic patterns, all of that. But, you know, you do what you got to do. And wow. if you're someone like me who loves flowers, that drive up at four in the morning is just, you, you don't mind it because you know what's on the other end of it, right? Exactly. Exactly. You do. And it's so exciting. And I used to love that process 
of buying. There was something about going into the wholesaler that really intrigued me from the way they set up to the type of products they decided to carry, the whole feel of how did, was there some psychology maybe even behind, you know, how, how do you want the florist to feel when they walk in? You know, well, it's like the candy it's an store. Inspiration. Yeah, it it's is. It's like creating it's a that candy store. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it works. I mean, it works. I was, I was absolutely um, a great example of that. But I used to find myself really timing the days that I would go to the Boston Market with the days that I knew that they were going to have a really big local drop off. Um, it could have been someone local to the area, but it also was regional. Um, farmers as well that were that were coming in and they might have only had that product there one morning of the week but I found myself really gravitating toward knowing that I want to do my shopping when those big local drop-offs happened and after you know years and years of doing this I just became more and more intrigued with the whole wholesale process but I and I always said to myself god if I had a market if I could just make a market what would I want it to feel like as a florist, as someone who needs like both, but needs really choice things and lots of beautiful things and different. I want exports. I want imports. I want, uh, you know, I want us grown. I want local. What would it look like if I were to do it? And the more and more I went, the more and more I think about it. And I said to myself at a certain point, you know, if I were doing a lot of weddings, I'm not alone. I have lots of colleagues in my state. If I'm a kind of florist who's yearning to see more and more and more locally and regionally grown product, but in a shopping environment where I could really see a whole bunch of different farms at once, maybe I'm not the only one. Maybe somebody else would really enjoy this kind of experience. And I sat on the idea for a couple of years, did as much research as I could, and really tried to flush it out in a whole bunch of different ways. And finally, just at the bullet, opportunity arose for a space opening up in the same building as my studio. Oh, wow. And How convenient. Yeah. Yeah. So when I when I go from the studio to the reserve, I just I walk outside around the corner. But um, it had to be that way. I don't, I don't think I could have handled both being far away from each other. So uh, that was a big impetus. And I said, I want to start a market where not only a florist can come in and shop a whole bunch of different farms, but I want the farmers to have a place to drop off instead of that model of they got to drive around everyone. They got to drive around and just deliver it to all the florists and they got it. They themselves either have to spend the full day in the van doing it or they got to hire someone to do it. Let's streamline this somehow, right? Let's make it worth it for the farmer and the florist. So that was kind that. of, that's the preface. That's the preface of what, of what the reserve was all about. Um, I really just wanted to curate a market for the florist by the florist, kind of just using some of the experience that I've had in 20 years of buying flowers and taking it to the wholesale level. Um, wanting to form those connections with florists that really, you know, wholesale, you really need to take the time to do that. You want to understand their color palette. You want to actually know what they're making because a lot of times, right, you don't even know what someone's making, but as soon as you start that relationship and the florist is saying, well, I have 10 centerpieces and they have to look this way and I really think I should have this, that's your opportunity to be like, I can certainly help you with that, but did you also know about this, that, and the other thing, right? I think being a good wholesaler, so much of it has to do with experiencing the other end of it first too, right? You know? Yeah, I agree. Um, so that's, that's how the reserve started. That was four years ago. And really? I took a chance. Four years, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I thought it was longer than that, but I mean... You've done mm -hmm. so much in four years. I, I'm, I'm, have my hats off. Thank to you. you. Well, thank you. I think I thought it would be a good idea, but I don't. I didn't think it would probably be as important, maybe as it turned out to be. Um, and it's kind of funny, you know. Like, okay, two years ago was COVID, and we were only two years old, and that was kind of scary. Yeah. Um, 
real scary, but we came out the other end of it, which is fantastic. Um, I think when I first started the reserve, I knew the general mission was to help florists, for sure help florists, make it easier, make it more comfortable, streamline it, also help the farmer. But there was always a little bit of doubt in my mind in the beginning saying to myself, is another florist going to feel comfortable buying for me? Am because you have competition because you right. Yeah. because you're, um, yeah. you have your wedding business. So, right. 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 And you know, not that anyone presented that way, but I had to say to myself, okay, well you're selling, you're asking your competition. If you want to use that word, because I don't even believe in competition, but you're asking your competition to buy from you. Right. How's that going to go over? Um, and I think maybe a little bit in the beginning, there was some of that kind of like questioning, but at the end of the day, I think people knew my motives and, and got it right away that this is about all of us. This is about community. And that's the best part of the reserve. Literally, when I tell you the community, when you walk in and there is no drama, there is no competition, every single floor is small, I know, small, <laughs> big, whatever, no one has a chip in their shoulder. No one is not ready to help another florist with an idea, a sourcing, a freelance. That's been the biggest takeaway for me that not, I did not even, I did not know the power of that that was going to happen. I didn't even know that was possible. So I'm like, that's why, I, okay, you can't see it. But if you go watch the YouTube video, you'll see my eyes get as big as silver dollars because I'm like, is that even I possible? I, I mean, I'm like, yeah. Dorothy, yeah. we're not in Kansas anymore. So no, anyway. for sure, <laughs> for sure. I uh, there's so many times uh, if I'm working at the reserve, I there's a couple of times where I've actually noticed it to the point where I stood back. I actually got out of the line of customers. I st I just pulled away from everyone. I just stood back and I watched it, um, and I was like, wow, everyone is so helpful to one another. Everyone, there is no jealousy. There is no animosity. There is no competition here when maybe you would think that there should be, but there wasn't. And it's only gotten better, especially during COVID. So many of our community of the reserve helping each other. Um, and the same thing goes with farmers. We've been able to curate some amazing relationships with farmers. One that was on your a podcast, um, I became so, so friendly in the past couple of years with the Hotel family. Oh, yeah. 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 Love yeah. them. I love them. I just love them. It, it's those kind of relationships, you know, that I could have never foreseen how incredible this community between the farmers and the florists has become. It, it's been so rewarding. Mm, that's incredible. Well, I, I, I'm excited to hear. I, I know... I see local product at certain parts of the year. And of course I see import product in there too. Uh -huh. And I know that's a juggling act. Do you, do you have like the basics or do you just strictly have uh -huh. the more high end, harder to find uh -huh. blooms? Yeah, we are a little bit more um, particular in the sense of, I don't have everything, okay? I don't have all the basics. I've tried to narrow it down to bringing in some really, really, really choice imports, bringing in a really decent amount of U.S. grown and American grown because we have a lot of florists that are super, super passionate about that. And then, of course, bringing in a plethora of local and regional. But I will say this. I, you're not going to come to me to go buy a case of Salal. You're just not. It's, uh, we don't even have it. I'll get you Salal if you want it, but it's not like I don't have 50 cases of it in the cooler. This is very, this is much more specific to like seasonality and really interesting things. Um, so it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more boutique now. That doesn't mean that we can't get large quantities of things we do all the time. We're still we're buying lots and lots of roses and we buy lots and lots of local things. So we have huge quantities of things, but I don't think you come to the reserve to go get your Alstromeria and your Salal and your leather leaf. So I think I, I had to streamline it somehow and that's how we decided to do it. Um, 
and there's nothing wrong with any of those products, not whatsoever. And I, I buy them myself from other people when I need to, but, um, for us, the mission has been about really, really unique. Right. Well, I mean, again, you can walk into almost any wholesale house and find those mm -hmm. things. And so mm -hmm. you decided to narrow your market down to these blooms that are curated, really, I mean, in a sense. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you're, and I'm, I can imagine that you probably base, um, I, I don't know if you do the buying or who does the buying, but whoever does that is probably based on yeah. years of experience from your mm -hmm. background in doing weddings. You know what's popular wedding colors, you know what the trends are, yeah. you know what future brides are booking, um, what better insight than, you know, to start yes. there in building your inventory. So I think yes. it's incredible. And that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it started. Um, I am the buyer. I love to buy. I, I absolutely love the buying end of wholesale. I love searching for the products. I love going on web shops. I love seeking out farmers. I mean, I really, really love that stuff. Um, You're speaking so my that's language. that's kind of where my... I know, I know I am. I, I think that that I can tell you're like, I can see it in yeah. your face. You're like, yep. Um, that's the stuff that really excites me. I want people, you know how it is. I want a customer to walk in and go, Oh wow. my God, what? You know? Yes, I do. So, um, that's, do, you ever, that's, do, you ever, do you ever get compared to like a drug dealer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like crack. It is like crack. Uh, to this day, we still, you know, it happened this week. We open a box of something and I'm still screaming. I'm still yelling. People are laughing at me being like, look at her, look at her, you know, 22 <laughs> years later. But I honestly feel like if the day comes when I don't receive a shipment or open something and not have that reaction, something, something's got to, you know, change. Yeah. So that's, um, Oh, it, that's the beauty of it. You know, every week is different. Yeah. You never know. It's never boring. Or hopefully it's not. Gonna come in. Yeah. No. So I know this week I noticed in your feed, are you doing your sweet pea um, mm -hmm. show or what? Sweet pea well, show. Yeah. Yeah. So how many varieties of sweet pea do you have in this demonstration right now? Right. Well, uh, I would have, I would honestly love to buy one of every color, but we held back a little bit this year. Um, I only brought in between like 40 and 50 varieties this, <laughs> this week, just so that people could see. <laughs> I mean, but here's the thing. Uh, Japanese sweet pea is a short-lived, you know, moment. And they're beautiful. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, and this is what I think everyone has come to know about the reserve. <clears throat> There's nobody that loves local and regional flowers more than me. Absolutely no one. The value of it is incredible for so many reasons. Okay. From the farmer all the way down to helping your economy, your local economy, sustainability, all of it. But I want to be honest when I say I have absolutely no problem with buying flowers overseas as well. I've been to Ecuador. I've been to Holland. I've been to flower farms. People just like you and me, they just happen to be in another country. They're growing something beautiful. They love it just as much as the farmer does down the street from me. Okay. There, for me, there's an inherent quality there's an inherent human side to these people growing these beautiful flowers for us and i'm i'm moved by what they grow as well i really really am um so you know sometimes people get confused and say well i don't understand is it i thought you'd only you know support local i i, I don't i i actually support it all um but with a heavy emphasis on our local something like the japanese sweet pea they are at their peak for about three months out of the year, right? Right. The fragrance is amazing. The color is amazing. The stem length, you can't find it anywhere else. Um, the dyed varieties, you either like dyed flowers or you don't, and it's okay whatever side you're on, but I got to tell you, the colors they've come up with, they get better and better every year. It's one of those things you got to see it to believe it. You know what I'm saying? So every year before Valentine's, we do the Sweet Peace Show because – there's new varieties, there's new colors, there's new dyes, there's new everything. And if you're like me, I want to see it before I order it. Usually that's how I roll. You know, I really yeah. want to learn about it. So 
we do this. People can come in, familiarize themselves with the new colors, the new names, and it helps them with their Valentine orders, quite frankly, because sweet peas at Valentine's at the reserve are a humongous thing. Um, and quite honestly, it's cold and gray and awful here in January, and I really need to see something beautiful. So we do the sweet pea show. <laughs> <laughs> and no well, one seems to mind. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm not gonna hate on that at all. So um, no. I uh, so with that, um, I was surprised. I mean, I knew that you did some shipping, but I don't think I realized how much shipping you mm-hmm. do. Um, mm-hmm. Do you yep. have customers all over the place, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So this was this was an interesting twist again. In the beginning, I never even thought about shipping. In the beginning, I don't know what I thought. I just wanted to see if it would actually work. But um, we started to gain some following across the country, which was really fun. I mean, Instagram has been incredible for that. Just showcasing a few pictures of things that we come in, it, you know, in the morning and source across the country. Oh, can you put that in a box and ship it? You know, of course, absolutely. So that started to build, we started to build. So we were always doing some shipping. It wasn't like a major thing. But then I think COVID really changed that um we were in a position where in those early those early months you know you couldn't get flowers and there were a lot of florists around the country whose major wholesaler was shut down uh maybe they they couldn't get flowers anything local right that's what i mean yeah they couldn't get anything but for whatever reason as soon as that happened we kind of went into this fight or flight mode and although we couldn't get many of the things that we were used to getting, I was able to still buy local. Some of these relationships we had with farmers, someone like the, like the Hato family. I think they'll always say, they always say to me, you helped us so incredibly during that time when, you know, major, bigger wholesalers weren't taking things, but they did the same thing for me. You know, we helped each other. We met that we met on the side of the road at rest stops in the middle of our two locations, hours away from each other, just so that we could bring back some of their beautiful blooms for the florist. And we just kept buying flowers wherever we could. We just had to find them wherever we could. And it caught on. And people around the country realized, okay, we do have some flowers. And so we shipped. We started to ship. And then we ship some more and then we ship some more. And I have to say in the past two years, another huge bright spot of this whole thing, not only just my local people coming in and my, my, you know, industry friends in the next neighboring States, but now we have these relationships with all these amazing floral designers around the country that I may have never met, but we're talking every day on Instagram. We're talking on the phone, we're texting, we're sending pictures. It's a whole new community. It's a whole new reach. And We've gotten really good at shipping. I used to be terrible at shipping. I didn't understand how to wrap flowers. I don't think in the beginning, I didn't understand it. Now I understand it really well. And my team understands it really well. And we pack those babies like so good. And we basically just assume that every kind of freight carrier is just going to throw it against the wall and step right. on it and drop it and lose it. So run over it. We yeah. take that into account. Yeah. Um, and it just goes back to that whole thing of like a florist knowing I know what's going to happen to that flower. If it's not wrapped properly, if it's not secured properly and that, that whole kind of thing. So shipping has been really fun. I mean, it can be stressful. You have no control after it leaves your door, but um that stinks, but uh, I love the connection we've made with people through shipping. And like I said, it's opened up a whole bunch of doors for for us and for our florists. So for that, I'm super grateful. Mm, that's incredible. So I know that you, I know that you talked about um, being concerned about how the florists were going to kind of mm-hmm. feel warm and fuzzy, you know, and stuff. And I'm, I, it makes me so happy to hear about the community that you've built. Um, I'm curious, um, how were the other wholesalers in the area? Because I can't imagine, um, I, yeah, that's an interesting dynamic that I'm kind of curious yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. So it was 50 50 for the most part. Um, when I started the reserve, I'll never forget the week that 
we were launching, where we were going out into the world and saying, here we are, we're doing this. I had to say to myself, there is a very good chance that every single person that you have bought flowers from for the past, what, 17 years, they may not sell to you after this. Really? You literally. Oh, yeah. I mean, you thought for about sure. that beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. it had, I think, honestly, it just would have been really, unfortunately, unrealistic to think otherwise. So I had to say to myself, if I'm going to go out on this limb, you, Samia, you need to understand in your own brain that you may not be walking into any of your wholesalers anymore. You literally might be on your own. You need to find flowers on your own forever. <laughs> um, and that happened with a few people that I had bought from for years and years and years and years and years. And then there were a couple of large wholesalers who had the direct opposite um, reaction who said that they would still allow me on the design side to still buy from them. And um, I even had one really fantastic wholesaler that had always helped me in the past. He um, helped me kind of get started and kind of point me in the right direction and give me a little bit of wow. advice and was really the only one. And it, um, it was a friend in New York and I'll never forget that. I will never, we still do business together today. I will never, ever forget those relationships. I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like when you're established and maybe I'm wrong, I'm still really young into it, but I feel like when you're established and you know that you're doing things right and you're comfortable with your business and you know that you treat your customers the best you can and you're always striving and seeking to get the best products, you can't, you can always feel a little threatened, I guess, by competition, but you can't feel that threatened if you yourself know that you've got a great business and you're doing right by everyone. So I think that the people that were really threatened by me, I think it was more about them and less about me. Um, I think maybe the best thing about the reserve is that we just have so much customer service. And maybe if anything that came out of this, maybe more wholesalers are paying more attention to that now. Right. But that was a rocky start that, that negativity, I'm not going to lie. I don't ever really choose want to experience that again. Um, it was scary and it was scary to be dropped by people so young in the business and having to find new suppliers. But like I said, some of these really confident and established wholesalers who really had nothing to lose by helping me did. And those little bits of advice really made all the difference. So um, I always think about that when people, I've had different people come up to me and say, you know, I'm really thinking about doing something like this. What could, could you help me? Could you do this? Could you do that? I always give advice. I don't always feel like I have the best advice to give yet. I still think I'm super young in it. I really don't. Um, I talk about what works for us. I don't think it works for everyone, but I will never, ever, whether it's on the design side or the wholesale side, I will never begrudge anyone the opportunity to start their own thing, to follow their own dream, to pursue a business idea. It's... It, it's really a beautiful thing. And like I said, if you feel confident in what you're doing, I don't think an element of threat needs to play into it. I really don't. Mm, I do too. I mean, I, I, I can see that. I also know, and I'm sure you have experienced this, that our industry is such a large financial high dollar value industry worldwide every corner of the yes. planet but yet yes. it is such a small community at the same yeah. time um i was talking everybody with, knows everybody somehow, I, I know right i know and, and it's like and if it and if we don't there may we know we have people in common we have friends in common and so sure. um I, and i think until you're in the floral industry, you don't get that sometimes. And I think yeah. maybe, you know, does that play a part into people feeling threatened? But at the same time, I think 
what you do is so specialized in a way. I mean, yes, it's mm. flowers, but mm. it's so curated that most yeah. wholesalers don't invest that capital into the kind of inventory, like exclusively that you do every single week that you're week. shipping flowers. I mean, yeah, yeah, for sure. And I agree with that. And that was one of the things where in the beginning where when we did go live with all of this and I spoke to a couple of the wholesalers who were super upset about the whole notion, I kept saying my business plan, our business model is completely different from yours. If anything, literally, I'm only going to carry certain things. I've made that up in my mind. I am going to funnel anyone I can't help to you. Literally. Yeah. There, I, there is enough work for everyone. And truly in Rhode Island, that is a very true thing on both the design side and the wholesale side. Right. So I felt like a partnership could have, I thought it could have been a good thing. You know, you help me, I'll help you. We'll right. trade off, you know, your customer can't find that. I might have it, but you know, you might have something they need. But some people, mm -mm, nope. No, some of those early um, wholesalers who wanted nothing to do with us still want nothing to do with us. Nothing has improved, nothing has changed. And it's very clear that I'm not welcome anywhere near their businesses. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just dead weight at that point. Time to move on. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm curious with all, <laughs> with all these different businesses that you've run, um, for people starting out, uh, what piece of advice would you like to, to share with mm -hmm. them? Well, I've been thinking a lot about you potentially asking a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> I ask it every time. So, yeah. I know. I know. And it's funny, this interview coincides with some growing pains on the Samia side of the industry uh, of, of the business where I have um, a lot, I need a lot more team members. Okay. We're, we need more hands on deck this year. Right. We actually need hands on both sides, but um, specifically on the Samia side, we need some great designers. And I keep thinking to myself, what is it? What is that distinguishing factor? I mean, I have, I have a great team. I love my team. They are fantastic. They are artistic. They are talented. They are driven. I love everyone that works at both outfits. What, what is it about these people that I love so much or just about this industry as a whole? And I've decided that a big part of your success in this industry is truly, and this is going to sound so basic, <laughs> but you have to love flowers. Literally. You have to think about that statement for a minute. You actually have to love flowers in my mind if you are going to be something special in this industry, wholesale, retail, I don't care what it is. I love what I do, but I can genuinely tell you it's because I love flowers. I love being around them. I love the way they make me feel. I love the way I make people feel with them. It actually is that basic to me. So for anyone starting out anything, there's got to be something about it. If it's not the product itself that you're selling, you have to love something. Truly, truly love it deep in your core to give you that passion to make it a business that you're proud of and that you love. And I, I you hear it coming out of my head, mouth and I'm like, it sounds so basic, but it really is the secret to success. Have passion. Have a deep love for what you're doing. Yeah. And the rest will actually come. Don't yeah. make it. Don't, if you don't love it, don't make yourself try and, oh, I think I could love this. I really think I can do this. I, I, I think I might like that. You can explore everything, but really pay attention to your feelings. Because if you don't love it, you're not going to be any good at it. How can you tell that somebody's just doing it maybe as a creative mm -hmm. outlet or they just, I don't know. Can you, you know, like when you hire people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what do you look for in that? Because I, right. I totally get what you're saying. 
I mean, okay. more than you can imagine. So um, okay. I'm curious when you're sitting people down, because I agree with mm -hmm. you, if you're sitting someone down, do you like you're interviewing them? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you figure that out about somebody? Right. Or, or maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe for the position you're yeah. hiring for, you know, it's uh, you know, maybe it doesn't matter. Right. But maybe, but right. it probably does. It, to some extent, for me, it really does because this industry is the labor of love in every way, shape, and form. We all know this. Uh, a lot of long hours on both sides of this business. If you if you don't have some kind of passion and some like real personal investment in what you're doing, um, you're not going to last long. And I think that I look for people who get excited about the basic things. I mean, really basic, like opening boxes and being like, oh, what is this? Look at this color. Does this, I, I look for people who ask questions. How, uh, what farms sell this? What colors does it come in? I look for people who are genuinely excited about flowers, where we find them, where they grow. Can we get more? The relationships with farmers. I really, really look for people who are excited about that. And and don't get me wrong, um, we have had in the past lots of wildly creative and talented flower designers who have made such an impact on this business, who I couldn't have done this without. And they are great in every capacity. But I can tell the difference. I literally can tell the difference when it's a job and a creative outlet or when it's sitting somewhere really deep in their soul. That's the best way I can describe it. Both are essential, actually. Both kinds of people are essential to our business. But I think we, so we feed off one another. Mm, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. It makes perfect sense. Um, and I love that. So, uh, as we're recording this, we are a few weeks from Valentine's, um, yes. the floral mecca of the year. And, yes. uh, well, I don't know, Mother's Day probably is more so, but anyway. Um, mm. And we're going to release this episode before Valentine's Day. So are you guys set up and ready to handle some mm. extra customers? Or can people, mm. how do people connect with the Floral Reserve? Yeah. yeah. So we're absolutely ready and set up and we welcome all kinds of new customers. Um, the best way to get to know us is obviously follow us on Instagram, but also go on our website, apply to be a, a customer, get all your paperwork in, it's really super easy. And then we do our mass availability every week to our customer base. We, we work a little different. We send out availability the week of telling you what we have in the market for the week. So it's very real time. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't pre-order things. So people put in pre-orders all season long. What does that look like? We have an order form on the website that says what date you want it. If you need it to be shipped, what date you want it shipped. And what are all of the things you're looking for and the quantities and the colors and any notes you want to give us, any pictures you want to attach, anything. So we function very much like a, any kind of other wholesaler that way, you know, pre-order is, is absolutely fine. But once you're um, signed up with us, like I said, you'll get those availability lists every week and a letter from me. I write a, a letter every week with the availability about what's special this week or what's on my mind or what's happening in the industry. Or, I don't know. Sometimes I just write because I need to talk, but um, <laughs> that's been really super cathartic too. And um, we help you out that way. But um, we are we are set up to to help in any way for Valentine's Day. We can take on anything. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Well, I look forward to continuing to follow your journey and see the thank beautiful you. flowers you're putting out into the world. And uh, thank, you. thank you so much for being on the Flower Podcast. Thank you, Scott. It has been a real treat, and um, you've gotten me all excited all over again for all things flowers and. Uh, it was a really treat to talk with you. So thank you. <laughs>